Welcome back to my animal education series. Today we're talking with some more folks from Australia and today we're talking about koalas. So do you guys mind introducing yourselves? Tell us the name of the organization and how long you've been working there? Sure. Hi, my name is Kayla Owsley. I'm the head of education at the Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, and you can probably tell by my accent, but I'm not Australian. I'm originally from San Diego, California, but I've worked at Lone Pine for around five and a half years now. So as I said, today we're talking about koalas, and koalas are one of Australia's most iconic animals. So the name of your organization is Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary. So are koalas the only animals that you work with? Great question. Even though we are called Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary, and we did start out only as a, a refuge for sick, injured, and orphaned koalas. Uh, we now have around 70 other species of all native Australian animals as well. So we've got dingoes, kangaroos, wallabies, Tasmanian devils, platypus, birds, reptiles, all sorts of native Australian animals. So definitely not just koalas. That's a common misconception. And what kind of environment can you find koalas in? So koalas are an arboreal species, meaning they live up in trees, uh, and particularly eucalyptus trees. So you'll find them in what we call here in Australia the, the bushland, uh, which is a kind of a semi-dry um, forested region where eucalyptus trees grow really well. Now, even though they like to eat eucalyptus leaves, they don't only go in eucalyptus trees, so you can find them in other trees other than eucalyptus trees. So Australia is as large of a country as the United States, but how much of the Australian wilderness is actually good koala habitat? That is a really good question. Um, koalas are only found along the eastern coast of Australia and uh, down south a bit around the bottom as well. Now, before European settlement, they were found all the way right down along the, the eastern coast of Australia, um, but their habitat has become increasingly fragmented due to urbanization and also most recently the bushfires. So where they used to be found in the millions all up and down the coast, they're now found only in little isolated fragmented bushland pockets which are becoming smaller and smaller. Not many people know this but koalas have a very limited diet. Do you mind telling us more about their diet? Sure. Koalas are very picky eaters. They eat almost exclusively eucalyptus. Uh, they have been known to nibble on a few different other types of leaves and sometimes eat a little bit of the bark and stick from the, from the trees, but generally speaking it's only eucalyptus leaves and only certain types of eucalyptus. So in Australia there's between seven to eight hundred different types of eucalyptus species and out of all of those koalas will only feed on between 50 and 60. Now that's koalas as a whole. Uh, regionally, the number of different species that a koala will feed from is even less. For example, around the Brisbane region, uh, there's only around 15 different species of eucalyptus leaf that a koala will eat. How does their limited diet affect their day-to-day -day life? So their diet impacts greatly on their day-to-day -day lives. Koalas are known to be quite sleepy. They do sleep between 18 to 20 hours a day. And that's not always fast asleep. Sometimes they're just kind of snoozing or dozing. But the reason they sleep so much is directly linked to their diet. Uh, eucalyptus leaf is mostly just fiber and water. It has very, very small amounts of sugars and starches and things that can actually be converted to energy. So they have to sleep a lot to conserve their energy and they sleep a lot because they don't get a lot of energy from their eucalyptus leaf. And photos and videos typically show koalas in arboreal environments. So do they ever come out of the trees or are they primarily a tree dwelling species? So koalas do spend most of, their, most of their time up in the trees. That's where they're going to be safer from predators, but they will come down to the ground from time to time. Um, interestingly, sometimes koalas go down to the ground to go pee. Um, not always, but sometimes. They also go down to the ground to move from tree to tree or if they're seeking out a mate. So during the breeding season, they'll be more likely to be down on the ground. Uh, female koalas are seasonal breeders. In Queensland, the breeding season is from around September to March, and you're more likely to see koalas on the ground out looking for a mate during that time. They can also come down to the ground in search of water. Now, usually a koala gets all the water it needs from the eucalyptus leaf, but in conditions that are really hot and dry, like the severe drought conditions that Australia's had for the last few years, koalas um, have been known to go down and, and look for water, even trying to drink from backyard sprinklers or swimming pools. Are koalas social animals or are they solitary? 
So in the wild, a koala is a solitary species. Uh, the male and the female will come together to mate and then go their separate ways. The young koala joeys will stay with the moms until they're about 12 years of age, and then after that they go off and find their own, their own territory. Um, the koalas at Lone Pine, a lot of them don't mind cohabitating and, and living with other koalas because they have been around those other koalas for their whole lives, so they're very used to it. But typically they are quite solitary. The males in particular can be pretty territorial. Um, they have a brown spot on their chest called a scent gland, and the boy koalas will rub that scent gland around the trees in their home range and also pee on the trees to make them extra stinky and that will keep away other competing males that might be in the area. Can also help attract a female during breeding season. Most mammals in Australia are marsupials, so are koalas marsupials as well? Yeah, so most of the mammals in Australia are marsupials um, and that does include koalas. The closest living relative of koalas is the wombat, which is a marsupial as well. A lot of times people call koalas koala bears, which is an easy mistake to make because they look kind of like teddy bears with their little fuzzy ears, but they're not related to bears. They are a parched, uh, pouched mammal, so they, um, they have a pouch and they're a marsupial. Could you tell us a little bit more about how a baby koala makes its way to the pouch? Yeah, koalas have a super interesting life cycle. So because they're a marsupial, um, that means that the females don't form a complex placenta like other mammals. So when the baby is born, uh, it's only a very short gestation period. So the pregnancy of a koala is only between 33 to 35 days. And then when the baby is born, it's super underdeveloped. Uh, it's about the size of a jelly bean, so like, like two centimeters. Uh, it's completely pink and hairless and like a slimy little worm. Uh, and it doesn't have its eyes or its nose developed at that point. Um, it doesn't have a fully formed nose, but it does have a sense of smell and it has little strong hands and arms. And it uses that to climb from the cloaca up into the mom's pouch. And then once it gets into the pouch, it has to latch on to one of the two teats that the female koala has inside of the pouch. If it latches on, it will stay latched on for the next few months and be drinking milk and staying in the pouch for about six months until it's ready to emerge from the pouch for the first time. Are koalas considered endangered or threatened? So that's something that's a, a good question and um, it is changing. It has changed even just recently, but nationally throughout Australia, koalas aren't listed as an endangered species. They are listed as vulnerable um, in particular states. So Queensland, New South Wales, and the ACT are three of the states where koalas are listed as a vulnerable species. Um, and especially after the, the bushfires earlier this year, they're definitely um, moving quite quickly towards becoming endangered. Last year, the world watched as large parts of Australia were suffering through brush fires. How did those fires affect the koala populations? Yeah, the, the bushfires earlier, earlier this year were completely devastating. Um, we were quite lucky in Brisbane to not be really directly impacted by the bushfires. We had fires up to the north and down to the south of us. Uh, and it was really devastating because I had already mentioned that koalas were dealing with habitat loss and fragmentation even before this. And a lot of those bushfires went right through really important koala breeding areas. So some of the areas that had the most healthy, genetically diverse um, group of breeding koalas is, is no longer there. So that will definitely have an impact overall on the genetic diversity of the populations in the wild and just the, the general numbers. I think they estimate that around 1.2 billion animals perished in those wildfires. Um, and they don't know exactly how many koalas, but it definitely had a major impact. And, We'll have to see what the long-term effects are because even if a koala is lucky enough to survive an event like a bushfire, they're left without a habitat and they're so heavily dependent on their habitat and such a, a specific habitat that they really need. So there's now really a limited area where you can put those koalas that have survived. And besides what you told us about the wildfires last year, how are humans impacting koala populations? So the, the biggest impact from humans has been habitat loss due to urbanization. Koalas, as I mentioned before, happen to live along the east coast of Australia, and that's where most of the people in Australia also live. So as the population of Australia increases, we are um, more and more encroaching on koala habitat. 
just clearing land to build houses and then also uh, building roads through koala habitats, which means that koalas have to cross the road to get from one area to another, which can be very dangerous. Uh, dogs, as I mentioned before, are a big threat to koalas. Uh, even just noise pollution can be disruptive for koalas if they're not used to certain sounds. So we've had a, a really big impact on, on koala populations. Could you tell us how many koalas your sanctuary has helped rehabilitate and release to the wild? Oh, well, we have been around since 1927. So in 92 years, I reckon there's been a fair few. Um, as I mentioned, we did start out as a refuge for sick, injured, and orphaned wild koalas. Uh, we started out with two koalas. Uh, over the years, our role in koala conservation has really shifted. So in the 1980s, we actually stopped bringing koalas in directly from the wild to participate in our breeding program. And that had to do with some changes in legislation, but also to do with the increase of disease in wild koala populations, which is a threat that I haven't even touched on yet, but it's another really big one. Um, the disease that probably gets the most attention that affects quite a few koalas up in the northern region uh, is chlamydia. They think that between 40 to 60 percent of wild koalas in the northern part of their habitat uh, could have it. Uh, so we, we didn't want to run the risk of introducing chlamydia into our healthy captive breeding program. So we've shifted more um, from rehabilitating and re-releasing koalas into the research and education that we can do with our genetically diverse, healthy population that we have access to. So we've uh, been really influential in the development of a, a vaccine that to treat and prevent chlamydia in koalas. Also researching how koala reproduction works. So we were the first place to do um, AI successfully on a koala, which could be really useful for putting new genes into the wild population at some point. So yeah, our role has shifted. We are, um, do have a fully functioning wildlife hospital at Lone Pine and we get in a lot of wild animals from birds and reptiles to kangaroos, uh, always with the goal to re-release them. But in terms of koalas, we don't bring in koalas from the wild any longer, directly. How many non-releasable koalas are currently in your care? So the, the koalas that are at Lone Pine, um, most of them will live at Lone Pine for the rest of their lives, which when you think about it, is a pretty good existence for a koala. They don't have to deal with um, predators, habitat loss, they get fresh food brought to them every day, they have regular veterinary care, our population is free of chlamydia, which is a big threat for koalas out in the wild. Oh, sorry, we've got around, uh, around 130 koalas. I think I mentioned we started with two, but I didn't mention that we now have around 130. Is there anything else that you would like to tell us about your organization? Um, well, I just reckon Lone Pine is a, a really special place. It's a bit of a Brisbane institution. It's been around for a very long time and we've got a long, rich history of caring for koalas and also educating the public about native Australian wildlife. We've been involved with numerous research projects over the years. Um, we recently built a brand new building called the Brisbane Koala Science Institute where we can carry on with our research and, and help um, think of ways that we can connect people with wildlife and educate them about how they can help animals in the wild because fundamentally that is our, our biggest goal is to preserve wildlife in the wild. I would like to thank you so much for helping me with this virtual interview. It's kind of difficult to get videos right now, but these virtual interviews are an amazing opportunity uh, to kind of go outside of where I can travel, so, especially since we can't travel. Thank you. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Don't forget to leave a big thumbs up down below, subscribe to my channel, and also check out my Instagram, at Cole Shirk. As always, I'll see you next week.